My name is Manuel Delgado. I'm a third generation old world luthier. And what that is, is somebody who hand makes musical instruments using the old world techniques. We're not using modern techniques. Uh, one of the things I like to always say is if the power went out in my shop, I could still build you a musical instrument. So we're using hand saws and we're using knives, many of which that we actually create ourselves for carving the necks or scoring the rosette and then chisels for chiseling out the channel to inlay. We're using heat to bend uh, sides and backs and do different types of uh, creation. So it's, it's a technique that was used in the old world. And of course, as things have advanced in the world, people are using more modern techniques, but we choose to stay using the old style in the way that my grandfather and my great uncle started. I'm very fortunate to have grown up in a family business. As I mentioned, I'm a third generation uh, luthier. Uh, the business was started by my grandfather and my great uncle in 1928, and then passed down to my father. It was started in, uh, in Mexico, in Torreon, uh, and then they eventually moved the business to Juarez in the 30s, and then brought it to Los Angeles in the late 40s. Uh, my father started in the business when he was young as well, and for a time left because he was in the army, uh, came back and got back into the business eventually. And same thing with me, I grew up in the business, um, started basically hanging around the shop from the time I was three, four years old and started helping out with repairs when I was about seven. Um, and yeah, I've just never looked back, so. <laughs> Being in the shop was always uh, a treat for me because I know now as I'm older and uh, a father, my grandfather and my dad, who I got to spend the most time with, I didn't really, I didn't get to work with my great uncle. Um, he moved back to Mexico by the time I was of age where I was doing anything in the shop. But uh, with my grandfather and my dad, they would always use the craft of building to give me another lesson that at the time I didn't understand. Um, you know, like my father always told me, you need to start with the end in mind. And when he was talking to me about that, he was talking about when you're building an instrument, you have to have the complete instrument in mind that you're building before you even start. So I literally will design the entire instrument in my head and then maybe go and sketch certain things out before I'm even selecting pieces of wood but that's also the way that I live my life. So in the type of business that I wanna run, the kind of employer that I wanna be, the type of husband that I wanna be, the type of father I wanna be, the type of friend or neighbor, whatever it might be uh, in the community, we have this end goal in mind. And when you do that, then you go about things differently. You have a focus on the things that matter to you because you consider all of those things at the forefront rather than come up to a situation and maybe be challenged and because you haven't thought it all the way through maybe you make a decision that would be contrary to what your goals or your morals or your uh, family legacy might be so having all of those answers ahead of time it still makes some of those decisions difficult but you've already gone through it and you've kind of played it out and it makes it easier in the long run and that philosophy that my grandfather and my dad passed down to me with many lessons um, is just to this day things that I still use. I was very fortunate um, growing up in the shop and getting to work beside my grandfather and my dad and uh, I had a great relationship with both of them. Um, my father was actually baptized in a guitar shop and he built his first instrument when he was 14 years old. So he set that ambition in me to beat his record. And when I was 12 years old that summer, uh, my father and my grandfather worked with me and I built my first instrument and uh, beat his record. Um, but there was a lot of lessons that I learned throughout that time as well. And one of the things that I always remember my grandfather would say is he'd say, uh, despacito porque llevamos prisa, which means take your time because we're in a hurry. So you take your time and you do the work correctly the first time because there isn't time to go back and do it over and over again. So those lessons, again, they can be applied and I do apply them in other areas of my life as well. 
but I have so many amazing memories of being able to work beside both of them, uh, learn from them. Um, you know, I say that we've been in business for 94 years and I have 94 years of experience because I was wise enough to learn from the things that they taught me and learn from the mistakes that they had already made to get to a, the point where they are now. So if they had attempted to do something and they realized it just didn't work, then it, I wasn't going to continue to try to go down that path if it didn't make sense. It doesn't mean that I won't challenge other ways of doing it, but knowing that they had already tried this method, that didn't work, then there was no point in wasting time and going that. And it allowed me to advance much further. And that was really a gift that was given to me from my grandfather and my dad by passing that on to me and allowing me to have that. We've been very, very fortunate to work with amazing artists from around the world. And because we hand make over 45 different types of string instruments, we have artists from all different genres. Uh, but that also has drawn attention to our family business. And uh, we've gotten noticed by movies sometimes where they've asked us to help with instruments. For example, we've worked with uh, the movie Desperado or the Three Amigos. Um, but long, long ago, my great uncle was actually commissioned by Walt Disney to make the original Mickey Mouse guitar that was used in the Mickey Mouse Club. And, you know, that's something that, of course, our family, we've always been proud of to know that this immigrant family that, that came here from Mexico and, and built this business has a part of uh, history in America with that instrument. And then uh, I moved to Tennessee almost 18 years ago, and uh, I was fortunate enough to get a call from Pixar uh, when they were working on the movie Coco. And I think the thing that I'm most proud about that was the gentleman that I spoke to, uh, his name is Jake. Uh, he kept telling me, well, we kept calling around trying to ask people, like, we need information on this, who should we talk to? And everybody kept saying that we should be calling you. So that meant a great deal to me because those calls were going to different schools and directors in mariachi programs around the United States, and we're fortunate to work with a lot of educational programs. So I'm uh, more proud of that, actually, than getting to be a part of the movie Coco, to know that those uh, teachers and educators who work so hard that we're fortunate and blessed to be able to work with were saying good things about us, and we were able to get the nod, and, and Coco uh, is something now that we can kind of mention as part of our history as well. So our shop is located in East Nashville. Uh, that's not by mistake. Um, we wanted to be in an area that, at the time when we moved here, it was very much like a bohemian uh, artistic community. And uh, they say iron sharpens iron. So when you're surrounded by other artistically minded folks, those creative juices just come alive. And we also wanted to be in a community where we felt that we could make a difference. We could help out. We could, you know, make an impact, not only in the city, but again, also in our neighborhood as well. Uh, the shop, originally I had a shop just behind my home because I didn't want to have a storefront. I just wanted to concentrate on building. And when we, first moved to the location where we're at now, it was just a big square, actually a big rectangular box. And I think this is important because if you come into our shop, I actually built the shop out. I put the walls up, I put the second floor up, uh, you know, I ran the ducts for the air conditioning, everything. So I say that's important because everything around us was created by us. We have tools that you know were passed down from my father or my grandfather or that I've made. We have a shop that we built out. And then that's the way our instruments are done as well. Our workbenches, we, made, we built our workbenches. Um, everything is done to what we need. So as we're creating, we're basically just surrounded by all these creations that we've done. And all of that energy, all of that goes into everything that we do. If I'm building something specifically for someone I want to know more about them. I want to know who they are. I want to know the, about their family. I want to know about the things that they're passionate about. Um, one of the questions I always love to ask people is when, especially if I'm building them an instrument, as I say, well, where are you when you're playing? And I don't mean like literally like, oh, I'm sitting in my living room playing my guitar or whatever it is. I, you know, they say, well, usually I'm 
close my eyes and I'll try to remember this time when I was at the beach with my family and we were doing this or, oh, I remember this one trip where I backpacked and I had my mandolin with me and we were up on the mountain and I found these other people who didn't even speak the same language, but we all played together. Whatever that might be, those stories give me inspiration. And then we try to implement that into the instrument somehow. And to the person who doesn't know the background, they'll look at the instrument and they'll say, oh my gosh, those inlays are beautiful, or I love the colors or whatever it is. But to the person that we built the instrument for, there's some significance there. So what better than to pick up an instrument that not only sounds beautiful and has the tone and the, and the brightness or the mid range that they were looking for, but also gives them inspiration from something of their past. I am blessed to have uh, two beautiful daughters, Ava and Lila. Uh, they were born about, Ava was born about four years after we first moved here. Um, Ava started helping me in the shop when she was about three years old. Uh, Lila started helping me when she was around four or five. And they both just are very much involved in what we do here. I always say the most important thing in our uh, family business is the word family. Uh, and Ava actually has beat my record. She built her first instrument and finished it two weeks after her 10th birthday. And now Lila, who's eight coming up on nine, is gunning to try to beat her sister's record. So I'm pretty proud of both of them. They're amazing girls, very talented. And uh, yeah, they're just they're the joy of my life. Well, I'm really excited uh, to be in the shop with my two amazing daughters, uh, Ava and Lila, and um, we're actually going to be talking a little bit about the instrument that Ava made. Um, she, as I mentioned, she uh, is the youngest in our family and the first female uh, to um, build uh, an instrument, and uh, she was two weeks after her 10th birthday she finished this mandolin. And now Lila is gunning for her record. So Lila is eight, coming up on nine, so that means we better get started, right, if we're going to do something like that. So um, I thought it would be really good if we kind of talked a little bit about um, some of the steps that we went through when, when Sister built her mandolin. So then you can kind of have an idea of what to expect. Does that sound fair? Mm -hmm. Yeah? So Ava, do you remember one of the first things that we might have done before we even started uh, finding pieces of wood, or, or what do you remember would be a better question of how the steps went when we started making their instrument? Um, well, I remember first you had me draw out how I wanted the instrument to look, mm -hmm. like the design and stuff. Right. And we did some measurements uh -huh. on a piece of cardboard and picked out like how we wanted the sound hole to be. Mm -hmm. Let me they, show what that is, yep. Yeah. I designed the headstock and the inlays and the fingerboard and just little things like that. Well, you designed the whole thing because yeah. even the shape of this is different than a standard teardrop mandolin. Most mandolins have a little bit more of a rounded body and you wanted it to have more of this shape. Mm -hmm. And then you wanted it to have the heart rosette and like you said, you had the heart up here on the headstock also. Can you remember the names of the woods that we used? Yeah, the binding is maple. Mm -hmm. The fingerboard is ebony. Yep, African ebony. African ebony. The top is spruce. Do you remember what kind of spruce? No. <laughs> Sitka spruce? Sitka spruce. Yeah. The sides and back are mahogany? No. Rosewood. Yep, but what kind of rosewood? African. African, African rosewood, rosewood. Known as? B. Babinga. Yeah. <laughs> it's been a while. I know. Uh, and then uh, the neck and the headstock are mahogany. Right, and all one piece, right? This is all actually one piece. So a lot of times I'm asked what makes a, a good instrument or a good string instrument, or, and it's really uh, depending on the instrument that we're talking about because every instrument is different. Um, I tell people, not that I'm saving lives necessarily, but much like a surgeon, uh, they can work uh, or operate on people from different cultures, different parts of the world. And although their diet might be different, the, their skin tone might be different, the language they speak might be different, they know where the vital organs are and what's important. 
And that's how I look at it with musical instruments. So whether I'm building an instrument from Latin America or from Ireland or from the United States or an instrument that originated in Africa, wherever it might be, I know where the vital organs are, where the tone needs to represent the sound that needs to come out. So what's important most of all is knowing that, knowing the kind of the DNA, if you will, of the instrument, because then you're going to put emphasis on the parts that matter. And if you're trying to build it traditionally, then you need to make sure that you're using woods that would have been used from that country because they couldn't go on websites and order stuff back then. They use whatever was harvested locally. And that's what gives it that original tone. If you're building a hybrid, well then of course you can go off of that and do something different. And I think that's one of the main things about, uh, our family that stands out is not only do we build traditionally but we build hybrid or modern instruments as well but nowadays you'll have somebody who will make an instrument let's say for example there's an instrument called the vihuela the mexican vihuela and it's used in mariachi and traditionally the top is made out of a wood called tacote which is from mexico the sides and back would have been either made out of nogal which is walnut or cedro which is cedar um, so somebody today might decide to make one and use spruce or cedar for the top and make a ebony bridge with a bone saddle and the instrument is going to have a lot more volume and voice but it's not going to have the traditional tone because that instrument did not have those things traditionally so sometimes when somebody thinks that they're making an improvement on something they may have made the instrument louder but you're losing the original tone that was intended from that instrument. And that's okay. If it's a hybrid, then that's what it is. It's a hybrid. But if you're wanting more of that, that uh, historical vintage tone or sound, then you have to look at how it was made originally and historically. Lila, I'm going to teach you how to bend the sides, okay? Yeah. We're going to use a sample of this thin piece of mahogany to do that. All right? Ava's done this. And I might have her show you a little bit of how we do it, okay? <clears throat> now, if we were building a tenor ukulele, I know that the side length of a tenor ukulele is 17 and a half, and the waist, the center of the waist, which is this part right here, is seven and a quarter. So I'll make a mark at 17 and a half, and then I'll make a mark at seven and a quarter. I might give myself a little bit of extra room so that way, if I accidentally am bending off one way or the other, that way I won't end up too short on this side or too short on this side. We have a little bit always extra room. We never cut it exact, okay? So this thing gets so hot that we need to, I've actually unplugged it because it's too hot. And then when it starts to cool down, we'll plug it back in again. So see how the water is starting to no longer evaporate? Mm -hmm. We're going to have to plug it back in pretty soon, all right? But for now, we'll leave it unplugged. All right, so what I need you to do is spray this piece of wood because we want to get it nice and wet. Wood has pores. Go ahead. Wood has pores in it. And see how I'm rubbing it in? That's good. And you want it to get into like what they call the cells of the pores. Go ahead. If you just spray it on the surface and it doesn't make its way all the way into it, then it's only wet on the surface and then you won't have any success when you're trying to bend it. It'll just dry really quickly and burn. All right, so see how hot that is? Woo, that's hot, all right? Now we're gonna plug it in. I'm gonna dry my hands because electricity and water are not a good thing to combine together, all right? So I'm making sure my hands are nice and dry. And then we're gonna plug this back in again. And I know that the heat is probably still okay, but we don't want it to get too cold. So, all right. So the first thing we do is we're gonna bend our waist right here. We have a mark right here on the side. We're gonna bend this until it makes that shape. Do you wanna give an example? You wanna show? Okay, you stand in front of me right here. We're gonna hold it. Now you'll notice we're gonna keep our hands away from the pipe. We're not gonna get this close, all right? But if we're too far away, we can snap it. So you wanna be close enough to where when you lay it on there, you'll hear it sizzle and you wanna go slowly and let it tell you when it's ready. See, it'll bend on its own. If you push down too hard, it'll crack. So we want to go slow, slow. Find a good spot there. See, it cracked a little bit. That's okay. We're just doing this for practice. 
slow, slow, slow. And see how it's drying? If we let it get too dry, then it'll eventually burn. Let's see, Ava. So let's see, Ava knows we got to hold it up. And look at that. We've got it right to the shape of the side already. Okay? okay. So now we got to get this shape going and this shape over here. All right? So you come over here in front of me. All right? We're going to hold it right here. And I'm going to put my hands inside of yours. So if anything happens, my hands are on the inside. Is that warm right there? Mm -hmm. Is it not too hot though, right? Okay. So now we're going to just slowly work it back and forth. And we'll see how I'm kind of slowly giving it a bend. Mm -hmm. Because now we're not doing just one bend for the waist. We want it to get the shape of what the bottom is going to look like. And I'm always looking at that pipe, making sure my hand's not getting too close to it. All right, there you go. Yep, see, you're smart. You move your hand over. Good. Good. And then we're just kind of slowly. I kind of, I say it's kind of like massaging it, you know? Like if your shoulder is sore, you wouldn't like jab it with a really hard pressure. You would just slowly massage it, right? And that's kind of what we're doing here. And see how I'm grabbing it at the end? And you're smart to keep your hands away like you're doing. And then you grab it again right there. Good. And then we slowly start to get the side. And it might take a little while, but we can start to see it taking the shape. See that? Mm -hmm. So we know we need to get a little bit more bend right here. Yeah. So we would just put a little bit more pressure here. All right. But now you get the idea, right? I want you to do this. Now we're not going to worry about this piece of wood anymore. I want you to hold it right here and hold it right here. And you're going to gently try to bend it again like that waist right there so you can see how it feels. All right, you're going to push down gently. And do you feel it starting to bend on its own? And when you do, then you put a little bit more pressure and a little bit more pressure. Go ahead. A little bit more. Keep going. Keep going. Not too fast. Good. You've moved your hands. That's good. I'm keeping my hands here to make sure your hands don't get too close. Keep going. All right, and then when we lift off, we're going to come away from it so we don't burn ourselves. And look what you did. See? Isn't that cool? And that's how you use the steam inside the molecules of the wood to help bend the sides. So. <laughs> All right, and now we've got to stay away from this thing because it's super hot. I think a lot of times people uh, don't realize that, yes, I'm a small business owner, but I'm actually an artist first. And I'm just very fortunate to do work that I love. And uh, I'm still as passionate about the work that I do today as the day I would follow my dad into the shop and, you know, get all those different smells from, you know, Brazilian rosewood has a very beautiful, sweet smell to it. Um, you know, cedar has a certain uh, smell to it. And I'm also uh, a romantic at heart. So the, the creation process and the artistry and the energy that goes into everything is still very important to me. If it was just about selling a commodity and putting things out, then we would have gone to figuring out ways to do things faster, cheaper, like most mass produced instruments out there. And that's okay, there's a place for everything. But when people come in here and they see what we do, and it's funny because they'll always say, oh, I had no idea that that's how guitars are made. And I say, oh, well, they're not because most of them are mass produced. When you think about, and I won't say the name, but one of the largest guitar manufacturers here in the United States averages one guitar every five and a half minutes. And we have about 200 hours of labor that goes into making one instrument. I mean, that gives you an idea of, you know, what you could do with machinery versus what it requires in the world that we live in. Even in its imperfections, that's what makes it perfect because it was touched by hands. And every process along the way, there was somebody who had a, a, a role playing in that, in how it was built, how it was bent, how it was inlaid, how it was shaped, the tone, the way the bracing was done, everything, everything plays a part in it. And that's for me one of the greatest things that I get to get this beautiful living thing and create it into something that 
just like my father and grandfather and great uncle are no longer here with me, but their instruments live on. These instruments will live on as well. And what do I want them to say about me or my family? And it's far more important that they're built correctly, with passion, with artistry, uh, you know, honoring the, the folk traditions that were passed down to me, rather than, wow, we made a lot of profit on that particular instrument because that's not what's gonna be remembered after I'm gone. Somebody's gonna look at that instrument and go, wow, somebody actually built this by hand. As we're reading up about this guy, this guy built these instruments, you know, bent the wood by hand in an era where he could have had a machine do it for him. And that's what's important to me. I always talk about the French poet, I believe it was, who said that with art and morality, you have to draw a line somewhere. And I've drawn that line. I'm not willing to compromise just a little bit. A small compromise here, just a little bit of one degree uh, angle, if you walk 100 yards down, is gonna be a huge gap. So if we start using mass-produced parts here or pre-made parts here, then it just becomes easier to just start giving all of those things away and now you're just assembling parts and then I'm no longer an artisan. I'm just, you know, a, a assembly line putting parts together. So. I, I love what I do. Um, I would rather spend way more time on something and lose money on it, but make sure that it's done right than just worry about the bottom line and try to get it out. And I think that's reflected in our family's history and our business. And I think that's why we're sought by clients around the world. I always talk about the guitar is one of the few instruments that you actually embrace it and hold it close to your heart when you play it. And they're trusting us with that guitar. We haven't earned that trust yet if it's a new client. So we can't take that lightly. It's very important for me when somebody is trusting us to do a restoration or a repair because we do those things as well. We work with the Smithsonian, uh, with the Fowler Museum, with the Tennessee uh, State Museum, with the Country Music Hall of Fame. And we're getting these instruments that can't be replaced because the history is in that wood. It's in that instrument. So it's super important for us that we respect that, that we have a, a respect for what we're, we're doing and what we're putting into it. And we want to make sure that we're uh, keeping intact the integrity of that instrument. It's just an honor for us to know that somebody took the time to bring it to us. They're spending their hard earned money and, and you know, paying us for the work. And most importantly, they're entrusting us with something that's very close to them. So a lot of times I'm asked about the steps or the process in making a musical instrument. And so, for example, if we're talking about a concert classical guitar, um, I mentioned earlier about you start, start with the end in mind. So you have an idea of what the customer is looking for, or if I'm just building something, then what am I wanting to achieve? And, and so I'm thinking about the tone, I'm thinking about the scale length, I'm thinking about the way the strings are gonna vibrate, uh, I'm thinking about how it's going to feel, the playability, all of those things. And then I want to think about the design and what that instrument is going to look like and sound like when it's completed. And I can see the whole step and see the instrument already done before I've ever left, you know, my chair or wherever I'm, I'm thinking about all these things. And then you go through the wood selection. So um, usually we're using Honduras mahogany for the neck. Uh, the fingerboard is going to be African ebony. Um, the sides and back, if we're building a concert classical guitar, it's going to be uh, usually some type of rosewood, maybe East Indian rosewood. Uh, the top, we might use uh, German spruce or Swiss spruce or Adirondack spruce or Red Carpathian spruce or Spanish cedar. I mean, there's all these different uh, Western red cedar. There's all these different species that can be used. Um, but in this case, let's say we're using uh, Swiss spruce for the top. After we have all of our wood selected, then we go through the process of starting with the neck first. And on the neck, uh, I cut it out of a block and the headstock and the fingerboard area where the fingerboard will be glued, the actual neck, are one piece. We don't do what they call a scarf joint or a jigsaw joint like some other guitar manufacturers do. And they use their marketing dollars to say that that makes the neck stronger, but that's not actually the truth. One piece is stronger than two pieces. The reality is they save money by cutting straight strips 
and then gluing an angle versus if you think about a, a rectangular piece of wood and if you're cutting the neck at an angle, well, you're gonna lose this whole piece of wood up here and when you get to the back, you're gonna lose that whole section below. So for a company, for dollars and cents, it makes more sense to make straight cuts and glue them rather than do it the way we do. But our goal is to do uh, the best instrument and make sure that it's going to have the strength and so forth. And we'll use those other pieces for something else. So you got the neck, you can uh, glue the heel on, which is also cut from the same block, Honduras mahogany, and then that gets put aside. While that's drying, you get your tops. And after you, we literally iron the top with an iron, just like an iron you would use to iron your clothes. And what we're doing is th these tops, I buy wood every year, I date it, and I just try to forget about it. So the wood itself might already have anywhere from 10 to 15 years on it before I even uh, start to work on it. And then when we iron it, we're getting any of the oils or anything out of the top. So we wanna make sure that we're, we're getting all of that out so we're not gonna have to worry about any wood expanding or shrinking more than it would normally do anyways, because it's going to, uh, to make sure the stability of the instrument is gonna be okay. After we do that, you have two pieces of wood. Everything we do with the top, with the back, and with the side is what we call a book match. So a book match is one piece of wood and you cut it in half and then you open it up. And now you have the grain that matches from one side to the other. And that's really important because I always talk about if you were to give a, a painter a canvas and half of it were black and half of it were white, then they would have to overcome that challenge of the imbalance of the canvas. But when you have a balanced canvas, now you can create whatever you want on it. And by having that balanced canvas of the grain, I can create whatever tone and sound I want with the bracing and the way the, the pattern that I use on it. After we've uh, book matched our top, the next step is working on the rosette. And the rosette is one of the more creative parts of the instrument. And quite honestly, it's just for ornation. There's nothing, it's just ornate, it's, it's decoration. It has, serves no purpose for tone or any of that other stuff. But for an artist, it'd be like, you know, take all the beauty away and just put all the pieces together. You'd still have a great sounding musical instrument, but then we wouldn't have any of our creation that we could leave behind on it, so to speak. And that to me is one of the most important because it's the focal point of the instrument. Um, we're using anything, I might use abalone shell and I hand cut it with a small jeweler saw or mother of pearl, um, or we might use wood inlay. And the wood inlay, when you look at it, it looks like these small mosaic tiles and people don't realize that those are actually handmade as well. And there's a process that involves, it's very painstaking, but you get a lot of these small inlays and you create your design and you have these long sticks, if you will, of different colors. And then you glue them and then you cut them into small tiles and then you're able to uh, create this pattern that goes around. This is all wood inlay. You can't paint this on because if you put paint in wood, wood has pores, it will spread. So this all has to be done. These wood uh, colors are all made before and then you inlay them. And in doing this, I use a, a, a knife and I score the rosette and then I chisel out the rosette and then we inlay these pieces right here, trying to match them as best as you can so that you're not able to see any kind of a seam between them. And we won't go all the way through. Sometimes people will come in and they'll see a top when it's being built and they say, well, how come you didn't do the inlay all the way through? Well, there's no point in wasting additional inlay when you know the fingerboard's gonna cover it. But this is one of the processes that I, I really enjoy and uh, it adds a lot to it. Like I said, if you took that away and you just had it looking like wood, the instrument gonna sound the same? Yes, absolutely. But this to us is one of the focal points. And if this is where all that beautiful tone and sound is coming out from, we wanna make sure that we're complementing it with something beautiful as well. And I wanna talk a little bit more in depth about the rosette because that seems to be a question that a lot of people are curious about and ask questions about. And when you see something that looks uh, as beautiful and as ornate as this does with all of this inlay, a lot of times people think it's a de decal or it's painted on after. And to be honest, on some cheap instruments, they are decals, uh, but not on ours. Ours are all wood inlay. These are all individual 
pieces of wood that are created and then made into these like mosaic uh, tiles, if you will, and then inlaid. So to give you an example, to do something in that detail would require a lot more time. So I thought I would do something a lot simpler to be able to show you an example of how you can make something like that. So what we would do is um, I'm going to make a pattern, okay? I'm going to use this for my center and then I'm going to surround it with like a cross. So I have maple in the middle and then I'm going to use walnut that's going to kind of make a cross by putting it on the top and the bottom and then it'll be on the sides of the maple also and then I'm going to border it with these inlays that have been stained black and this is called lemoncillo, it comes from a lemon tree the wood, so you see I got a black inlay and then walnut and then I'll do another black inlay, you want to hold those two for me Lila? Thank you okay and then I need the walnut, thank you, and then I need the maple, thank you, and then you want to grab me another walnut, yep, and give me another piece of that, thank you, and then you want to give me a piece of the black inlay, thank you, and then walnut again, and that goes in the middle here, and then another piece of the black inlay, please. Like this. Ava, I might need your help here in a second. There we go. We'll slide that up just like that. And then now we have, you see that pattern? Mm -hmm. You see that? We have this pattern that has been created. And Ava, can you give me some string there, please? Perfect. All right, you hold that for me, okay? I'll try not to yank it out of your hand. And then we would glue this, and then we would just use this string to hold it all in place, and it would dry. And then, much like on a cooking show, right, we have one that's already been glued together. And here is an example of that that you'll be able to get a close-up of and see. Okay, so now you can hang on to those, and it doesn't matter if they come apart because we've already use that. The next step that we would do is we would get a saw like this and I use my fingers. Remember I've taught you girls like when you're cutting, when we're cutting vegetables and stuff, we always curl our fingers like this because then if you accidentally do scratch yourself or cut yourself, you're not cutting off a part, you're just kind of scratching it. So I do the same thing here and I use this as a guide so I can put the saw up against my fingers and then that way when I'm cutting them, they're all going to be the same size. So as I'm cutting that, and then we just kind of keep going like this, and then there's one right there, you see? And then we do that over and over again, and we get what we have here. Grab me that piece of spruce top there, Ava, please. Perfect. Thank you. So. We have our spruce top, we would have a rosette, and then with these inlays, we would then chisel out a section, and then you could put these pieces in here like this, side by side, and you can create a rosette. And then the way that I like to do it is after you have that, you can border it. Where's that piece of inlay you had earlier? Can I see that? Thank you. You can use this maybe on the outside and on the inside, and then it just kind of helps border everything together. And that's how you make a rosette. <laughs> so after the top is book matched and the rosette is inlaid, um, I mentioned the neck. The next thing we do is I'll go back and then we start to shape the neck. And the, keep in mind, this is not even part of the instrument yet. So we're shaping the heel, not the headstock, just shaping the heel, shaping the inside. Everything on the inside is sanded smooth. And the reason that is, is even the bracing. After we do the neck, we're gonna brace our top and all of our braces are rounded, uh, smoothened out. I'll even finish the inside of the bracing. Sound travels like air. 
So if you think about a vehicle, if you want that vehicle to be aerodynamic, you don't want it to have a hood that comes and then it has a 90 degree angle with the windshield because that's going to be resisting as you're trying to travel at a higher speed. Well, it's the same thing with sound. If there's any sharp objects in there or squared off objects, that sound won't travel. It'll eventually just kind of get cut off and, and die out. And we want it to have a resonance. And the way that you get that resonance and that long sustain is by making sure that everything internally is smooth. Um, even the way when we know we're making a cutaway, we brace it differently. Uh, so that way some people say, oh, well, if you do a cutaway, you're going to lose some of the tone because you're losing part of the top. But not if everything is done with the intention and knowing what you're doing ahead of time. Or even some people will say, well, the back doesn't play a part in the sound. And I always tell people, whether you think it does or it doesn't, you're right. And what that means is if you think that the back doesn't play a part, then you're not going to be considering that when you're building the instrument and it's not going to play a part because you're not taking that into consideration. But we believe every aspect of the instrument plays a part. So we're very conscious of how we go about everything, the thickness of the back, the way it's braced, the way it's connected with the kerfing on the inside, everything, everything plays a part. And once we get to putting everything together, bending the sides by hand, by wetting the wood and steaming it, um, uh, putting the back on and the whole instrument is built around the neck. We don't do what they call a dovetail joint like other builders. Our neck can, is not separated from the body and then put on after. Um, and uh, people will say, well, that's great until you have to do a neck reset, but you don't have to do a neck reset on a solid neck because it doesn't shift. Only instruments that have two piece necks are the ones that over time with the wood expanding and contrasting that neck will give and that's why the neck has to be removed and reset. When it's one solid piece, I have instruments from my grandfather and my dad from the 60s, necks perfectly straight on them. So once we get everything put together, we glue our fingerboard, fret, cut out the windows if it's a classical guitar, in, you know, tuners, everything. I actually will string everything up and actually before we fret it, I string it up, it doesn't have finish on it yet, I tune it up and then I like to put it in front of a speaker and usually play classical music. So then it's getting all the resonance of all those different tones. And I'll come back to it maybe up for a week or two, make sure the tuning is correct. And then after that, I'll check the neck angle. If everything looks good, if not, I'll flatten it to where it's perfect. And then I inlay the frets, take everything off, sand it, and then we start doing the finish process. And all that's, uh, we use a nitrocellulose lacquer. Sometimes we'll use a French polish and we even buff the instrument out by hand. Uh, that way we don't have to put really, really heavy loads of finish on it. When you put a heavy load of finish, then that's where you want to use a buffing wheel because you can finish it the, the, the shine of the instrument a lot faster, but you can afford to do that because that wheel is spinning so quickly it can burn off a lot of those layers of lacquer and you don't have to worry because you put so much finish on there. When you do it with thin layers like we do, we're not killing the tone of the instrument the whole point of the finish is to protect the instrument only, but not to kill the tone. So when we come through and buff them out, we literally buff them out by hand. And uh, that requires less heat uh, and requires taking less layers off. So that way the finish is thinner and you get better tone and sound for the end result. So to give you an example of how this instrument will resonate or sound. is built well you can get the response from it using your right hand if I want a warmer tone if I want a thinner bright tone and if I want more resonance and more volume I'm playing the same notes it's just hand position and knowing how to get the instrument to respond
So to give you an idea of some of the other aspects of the instrument or some of the pieces that we might say like that are ornate, like for example, our, uh, our purfling. So here's a better example. You can see visually this inlay that's around the top on the inside here. This is what we call the purfling. And then this piece out here with the beautiful inlay below it, this is our binding. Now, the binding actually helps to bind the top and the side together or the back and the side together. So it actually serves a purpose um, for a structure. Uh, we make it look beautiful, but it does have an important role that it plays in the instrument as well. The purfling, not so much. The purfling is just to complement. And if you notice, if it's done well, you're doing something that helps draw you back to the rosette. So it's complementing the rosette with something with the color or something uh, that's, that's helping to draw your eye back to there. Same thing with the bridge. Uh, this is what we call a tie block. Um, but this inlay right here, it serves no purpose other than just to draw your eye back to the inlay and to the beauty of the top and it should all complement everything. Um, on the headstock, we'll do the same thing. We'll add inlay. This has got mother of pearl and wood. Um, this is a truss rod cover. And all of these things are just more decorative. Um, and then same thing on the, on the back here. You can see this piece of inlay right here. That's just decorative as well. But the parts that are important are how the bracing is done internally, the way that everything is structured, the angle of the neck. There's a lot of mathematics and physics that play part in the way an instrument is played. Um, you can give everybody all the best pieces in the world and they can still build a horrible instrument. If the intonation is wrong, if the angles are wrong, if uh, the construction is done poorly. So it's not just about having the right ingredients. You have to know how much ingredients and when to stir the pot and when to let it simmer and when to let it boil. All of those things are what makes the difference between somebody who's uh, trying at what they're doing, good at what they're doing, or a, a master at what they do. And I will say unapologetically that I do believe that I am a master craftsman. And um, it would be wrong for me to dismiss all the work that my grandfather and my great uncle and my dad put in and train me and the gifts that God has given me and to give myself any less uh, praise for what I'm able to do. Because you know what? There's a million other things that I'm really, really bad at. But this is something that I'm passionate about, that I was smart enough to listen. I, I learned from the masters that came before me. I was an apprentice. And the way a true apprentice is, just like my daughters are now my apprentices, is they continue to be an apprentice until the master passes away and then they become the master. So I, with great uh, humility and, and uh, gratitude, I, I look at that role as something that was given to me and another beautiful gift that my dad left me behind. And I think the greatest part is when you're done building an instrument is actually giving it to the client and seeing their reaction. And uh, it's pretty awesome when you can still make uh, grown men cry uh, when they get their instrument for the first time and they're able to hear it and see all the different conversations and everything that we've talked about come to life. Um, that's the hardest part too, because you've just spent all this time building this instrument and then you have to say goodbye to it. Um, but Every now and then they come back to visit if they need a new set of strings or a setup or something like that. And that's, that's always nice. So, um, yeah, I guess that's, that's why you do what you do. If, uh, you know, I, I think you have to decide what it is and why it is that you're wanting to create something. If you're looking at a career or, or some type of a journey as an artist or an artisan. Because if the goal is just financial, then you're going to figure out faster ways, easier ways, ways to cut corners, different things like that. Um, and you're going to turn it into more of a business than an art or a craft. Um, but if you're fortunate to be able to uh, do your art and it turns into a business, then every day you get to create and it never gets old. You never get tired of it. Um, I'm very, very fortunate because I'm trying to pass this 
uh, knowledge down to my daughters, not because I want them to continue in the business. I want them to do whatever they want to do in life. That's the most important thing for me. But I want them to know how to do, uh, create different things, whether it ends up being guitars or something else. I want them to have that as a way of escape for them. So if they decide to go into uh, some other type of career, they have that as a way to come home and, and be able to relax. And that's ultimately what a lot of our clients they're looking for is just a way to come home and hear those strings and then just kind of get lost. And let everything from the day melt away. And have, you know, almost like a, a friend that you can lean on. Thank you.